All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our webinar on grant writing tips and how to find funding for walking and biking projects. So thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, we are, in case you don't know us, we're the Active Transportation Alliance, and we, we're a nonprofit. We advocate for walking, biking, and public transit to create healthy, sustainable, equitable communities. And uh, today, um, we've got some special guests, two advocates, uh, Rachel Goodman and Ann Nagel, and we'll be hearing from them um, in the second half of the webinar about their experience um, winning a federal grant for their um, local school district. And then we have Julie Strand from the Active Transportation Alliance. She's our Director of Development. Um, and I'm Maggie. I'm an advocacy manager here. So um, I'm going to get us started. Um, we're going to, I'm going to be sharing different funding sources that we know of that are common places to look for funding walking and biking projects. Uh, Julie's going to go through uh, some tips on how to write a grant and how to um, just apply some, how to create a successful application. Mm -hmm. And then um, we'll hear um, from Ann and Rachel about their um, success in winning some funding. And then we'll open it up to Q&A from all of you. Um, and if you do have questions, if you're on your computer, you can use the little comment um, icon and type in a question. And we'll, we can try to address it if we can during the webinar. Otherwise, we'll wait till the end. Um, and again, we're recording this webinar, so you can um, share this with others. And if you have to jump off, um, the info will be um, available online a little later. Uh, and if you're on your phone, so we, we do have slides, but um, we'll be speaking um, mostly, so you don't need the slides, but you can, again, watch it on YouTube later. So um, to get us started, so funding sources that we know of, and there are, of course, more than what I'm going to be speaking about, but these are some of the big ones um, to bring your attention to. And um, on some of these slides, a few of the funding sources are, are highlighted in red, and those are just some upcoming funding sources for this winter um, to be aware of. And if you're an advocate, these are great um, uh, programs that you should make sure to share with your village or city planner or public works or community development departments, just any contact you have at the city um, or village. Uh, but okay, so some federal funding sources. So congestion mitigation and air quality is a very um, popular funding source for walking and biking projects. So it funds projects that eliminate congestion or reduce congestion or improve air quality. So the name is self-explanatory, but this um, project or th this grant is administered through your NPO, which is a metropolitan planning organization. So what that is, they're designated uh, transportation um, policy and funding organizations. So they receive money from the federal government and then they pass that on to local governments. Uh, and so the MPO, your local MPO would be taking this CMAC money and then distribu distributing it to the region that they serve. Uh, in the Chicagoland region, we have CMAP, Chicago Metropolitan Ag Agency for Planning, um, in the Peoria area, it's actually the Tri-County uh, Regional Planning Commission, for example. Um, so there's, you'll, if you don't know what your local MPO is, just Google it um, so you can find out um, when grant opportunities are available. So another um, grant administered through an MPO is the um, TAP program. Uh, as well as the Surface Transportation Program, which that um, is a program that is, uh, that money is available right now. Um, funding applications are open for local surface transportation um, funding. So what happens with this money, the, um, your NPO, um, well, in the Chicagoland region, so CMAP, the NPO, um, distributes money to Council of Mayors, Council of Government um, in the regions, and there are 11 of those in the Chicagoland region. Uh, and um, each 
Council of Government or Council of Mayors has their own application process for that surface transportation program money, so STP funds. Um, so this is available right now. It's a really, it's a, a major funding source for walking and biking projects. So um, we'll, after this webinar, if you've registered, we'll send out links to um, these uh, uh, funding sources that are available right now. Um, so, and then the community development block, block grant is another type of federal funding source. Um, more federal funding sources, these are, a lot of these are administered by IDOT, so our Illinois Department of Transportation. Uh, so ITEP funding, Illinois Transportation Enhancements Program. This is, has in, in the past been all federal money and it's a, it's a very important source for walking and biking projects. And now after this last year, we won $50 million of state funding that's going to be added to this program. So um, on an annual basis, so there will be even more funding available for um, through ITEP. So this is one to keep your eye on. It should be available um, later this year. Um, and we want to help communities be prepared to apply for that funding. So um, I'll be speaking a little bit more about that in a moment. But um, Safe Routes to School funding, also administered by IDOT, we'll be hearing from Ann and Rachel about how they um, won money through the Safe Routes to School program. Um, and there's various other programs, but a couple other to, others to highlight right now is the um, two programs administered through Illinois Department of Natural Resources, so which is IDNR, it's their Recreational Trails Program, and the Illinois Bike Paths Grant Program. Um, these are open right now. These close, I believe, in mid-March. So you have a, about a month and a half um, to left to apply for these programs. And I should mention, with all of these federal sources, uh, there is usually a local match. So that means that the federal government will pay for 80% usually of the project and a local government then needs to pay the remaining 20%. Um, so um, in the case of these two IDNR grants, that's actually um, slightly different. Um, there is a 50% match. So these are, these are a little more difficult to um, fund locally, but sometimes there's a project that's set up just right and getting that 50% of additional funding is all that's needed. So they can be very valuable um, programs, but just require a larger local match. Um, and a little bit more about that ITEP funding. So probably a lot of, most of you know about the ITEP funding um, that from the capital bill, from the Illinois capital bill, where there will now be an additional $50 million every year for walking and biking projects. And what's happening right now, IDOT is working out the funding guidelines. So trying to figure out when does the funding cycle start? How exactly do you apply? And um, there's an equity component where um, low, where 25% of that of those funds will be going to lower high need communities, lower income high need communities. And they're trying to figure out what does that mean? What is a high need community? So defining that. Um, and the, we have some staff here at Active Trans who are meeting with IDOT regularly to kind of um, push for, um, you know, what we see as a fair um, funding system and application process. So funding should be available in the fall and we believe um, applications will open in the spring or summer of this year. Um, we are going to plan to put some webinars together to review how to apply for ITEP funding um, once we know more, um, but just wanted to give you a heads up on, on that. And this this should be a really big, amazing funding source for, for all your walking and biking dreams. <laughs> um, so in addition to federal uh, funding sources. There are a lot of state and regional funding sources. Here are some Chicagoland region um, examples. So RTA, our regional transit authority, has a community planning grant, often around um, metro stations um, to improve access. CMAP, so that's our local MPO in Chicagoland. Um, they have a local technical assistance program, which they can help put some plans together for maybe if you want to have an active transportation plan for your community, you can apply for their program. Um, ComEd has a 
um, grant as well, and I believe that's more um, statewide. And then Invest in Cook, I just wanted to mention this one. This is a um, Cook County only program, um, but I think it's a good model and potentially something other counties could consider putting together, but they set aside $8 million, about $8 million every year. Uh, and it goes towards transportation projects um, in Cook County and it's um, through app like people apply, communities apply, apply for this money and it can be it can fund any phase of a project um, which some grants there are different stipulations so some grants will only fund um, construction and some will fund plans so um, this investment cook will fund anything um, and it there have been a lot of uh, walking and biking projects that have come out of uh, this particular grant so something other counties I think um, should consider um, and then there's finally a lot of private uh, funding sources, and these are really great for um, uh, for maybe you as an advocate, if you want to do some type of event. Um, the, the, these can be these are often a smaller um, amounts of funding. Um, so people for bikes, they twice a year they have a community grant. Um, it could maybe be applied to bike racks or um, some to some type of getting a trail project started. Uh, Rails to Trails also has a, a fund for um, could fund maybe tools to build a trail or a plan or um, actually building a trail. Um, these the next two on this list. So it's AARP Community Challenge Grant and the America Walks Community Challenge Grant. These are smaller um, grants, usually under ten thousand, I believe, ten thousand dollars. Uh, and they fund, um, they funded a couple people that I know um, in the Chicagoland region, some advocates, their projects that funded um, in Batavia, they, um, some advocates put together a documentary about walking and biking and they received this grant and so did some advocates in Wilmette. Uh, they received funding to do a pop-up protected bike lane. Um, so that particular one, the AARP community grant is I was just looking at their website and it said um, any day now, basically this grant um, will be open. So it's a really great one for advocates to apply to, to do a smaller project. Um, and then of course there's a handful of other different um, funding sources. You can also look toward two foundations. You can look at local hospitals, healthcare providers. You could look at rotary clubs. I know of some communities who have funded bike racks through rotary clubs. Um, and the Forefront Library, I'm gonna let um, Julie actually speak to that as a potential resource to find other funding sources. Yeah, um, so the, the Forefront is uh, an organization um, based in Chicago um, that has a free to the public nonprofit library where you can access a bunch of different resources, um, but one of the uh, really nice ones is they have an online um, directory of funding sources that uh, that you can access there, as I said, for free, and you can um, sort of tailor it, um, the search to find uh, funders who are interested in funding projects like yours. And it's a really, a really powerful tool. It's really great. They do free orientations in the library. Um, if you go to their website, you can, I think you just need to sign up for one and they can do it on a, on an appointment basis. But it's, um, unfortunately, the hours are a little limited. It's, um, it's open from, I think, noon to five on weekdays. Um, but if you are able to access that, it's a really good spot to just sort of prospect for different fund funding sources. Great. So um, if you on this call, if you want updates about funding opportunities, we do have uh, some Google groups um, for advocates, for municipal staff. Um, and when I learn about new grant opportunities, I email those Google groups. So if you're not already on one of those groups, um, you can contact me and let me know and I can get you added. Um, and all my contact info will be at the end of the webinar. So um, if you want to be on, you're very welcome to be on the Google group. And then we also have uh, on our website, activetrans.org slash complete streets coalition. Um, if you go to that page and you scroll down a little bit, there's a, a resource list and there's a link to uh, the funding opportunities that we know of and then the links to um, learn more about those funding opportunities. 
All right, so now I am going to pass um, this over to Julie, who's going to be talking about grant writing tips. Thanks, Maggie. Um, yeah, so I just, um, I'm going to go through um, just some, some kind of um, a basic overview of some things to help you make um, your proposals as strong as possible. Um, so the, the first thing that I would suggest, and this might be sound pretty basic, but it's start early. Um, a lot of times actually writing the, the narrative of the proposal is one of the less time consuming parts um, and sort of everything around it can take a lot more time. And sometimes that means gathering um, things from other places. You might run into questions that you want to be able to ask um, either the person, either the, the uh, person who it has issued the RFP or um, you know, trying to find other resources where you can you can get an answer. So you want to give yourself enough time to be able to go through those things so that your proposal ends up being really strong. Um, and one of the other things I would suggest doing first is going through the entire application and just getting an idea of everything you need. Um, paying special attention to attachments. Um, I have definitely um, been been in situations where I was surprised by a couple of attachments that took um, some looking into it and gathering information. And you don't want to be in a position where you're maybe down to a deadline or have a day or something to put things together and that these um, attachments can cause um, an issue. And what are some of maybe the, the general attachments you'll need? Um, they will always ask for a budget. Um, so that's something that you'll need to get together and look into. Maybe for that you might need an estimate from a contractor. Um, you might need to know some of the people that you're partnering with and how much they're going to receive for this. So those are things that you'll want to think about ahead of time. Um, sometimes they'll want resumes or CVs from all of the people that are going to be working on the project. Um, maybe they'll want letters of support or partnership agreements. So those are things that they, they might ask for. So kind of just figuring out everything that you already have and things that you need and making a list of that can really help you plan ahead so that you, you have everything together by the time you want to submit the application. Um, next is um, be sure to provide context. So as you're thinking about writing this, um, just remember that the people who are reading the, the application uh, might not know anything about, about your town and about this specific project. So you want to be as specific as possible about um, what impact this project is going to have on your community who will be positively impacted, and uh, and the, any work that's already been done uh, that you're building off of so that they sort of know um, everything about this project and where it is and where their funding is going to fit into that. Um, so I, um, just as an example, I had a, um, I was invited to uh, be on a committee that was looking at um, different applications that might, um, might get funding. And there was one application that, uh, provided very little information, um, almost none about about the project really. And when we all sat down, it had been, um, you know, the, the the scoring on it was fairly low because there just wasn't a whole lot of information. And it just happened that someone on the committee um, knew the context of the, the the project and were able to sort of give us a lot more of how it was going to be impactful and how it was going to help that community. And it ended up um, really changing the way we all thought about it and us kind of reassessing all of the um, how we'd how we'd rated the project and and you know. Um, really sort of brought it up. So, so be sure that you provide all, all of the information about how this is going to help. And, and this is stuff you already know, you know, it's, um, you know, people, this, there's a crosswalk that connects a, a high school and a, and a grocery store and kids use it for lunch. And um, it's really dangerous across a highway. And, you know, context like that can be really helpful when people are trying to get an idea of what this project will really mean to your community. Um, and if you're allowed to, sometimes they'll have uh, an area where you can provide extra attachments um, if you want to. And that's a really great place to, uh, to provide some supportive or illustrative attachments. So that might be pictures. If you want to go out and take pictures of um, the place where you do the project, it might be a map where you can show sort of an overhead view of what this would look like or the, the entire stretch that maybe you're looking on working at. Uh, but things like that can really bring the project to life. And it means that uh, the person reading it will have have less work to do, essentially, and it'll really help help them understand what you're trying to accomplish with your project. 
Um, next up, you're going to want to demonstrate local investment. Um, so say you already have a complete streets policy in place and the project you want to do um, is maybe one of the things in that complete streets policy. You definitely want to attach that or link to it so that they can see that that work has already been done because um, it also shows that there's already support for some of these things. Um, and that's uh, really great for a funder to know. Um, same thing if you have an ex um, inactive transportation plan, be sure to include that and to and to reference that in your proposal um, so that they know that some of this work has some of this groundwork has already been laid and you're building off something already. Um, and then you also want to connect to a funder's goals and priorities um, and make this very clear. So most funders have their own set of things that they're trying to accomplish with the with the money that they're giving. And sometimes that'll be really explicit in the RFP and it'll say, you know, we want these funds to be able to, um, you know, we want that to support projects that are going to have community led solutions for bike plans or, you know, something um, they'll usually be pretty explicit about what they're hoping to accomplish with the funds. Um, and other times you can check in, check out their websites if it's not as explicit. Um, so for example, IDOT has a long range transportation plan um, that you might uh, go online and look at if you're, um, if you're applying to something that's being funded by IDOT. They have some, uh, in the long range transportation plan, they have some really specific areas um, that they have laid out that they're looking to target. And so looking at that and figuring out how your project fits into that vision and how you are going to help them accomplish their goals with this project is really good to connect to um, because it also ties into sort of their values and what they're looking for. Um, and it also, uh, and you'll want to be pretty explicit with that in the proposal. So um, I went online and just uh, was kind of looking at some of their goals. So like they, they have some really big categories like mobility and they'll say something like improving, they want to improve mobility by developing a multimodal network that helps move people from place to place and support economic development. That gives you a really clear picture of things that they're, that they're looking for. Um, and if you can connect your project back to that or any of the other things in their proposal uh, or any of the other things in their plan, that will really help, um, help them see how your project fits in with their goals too. Um, and then, yeah, Maggie, do you want to? Um, so some thoughts about how to make a more competitive proposal. Uh, if um, in many cases you're going to be like a, a grant will be for a specific location or within a, a city or a village. But in some cases, working with your neighbors can um, make your grant stand out, um, especially if there's some regional goal, if you're connecting a trail between a few different communities. So, so showing that there's uh, multi-jurisdictional collaboration uh, in your proposal. We've seen um, a handful of those types of projects um, uh, win funds. Um, so um, that's something to think about. Uh, and also, as Julia was mentioning, just showing that there is community support, um, that you have you've built relationships with people in your, your community, and they also are supportive of your your idea, um, your project, and um, getting letters of support from some of these um, different community groups or maybe elected officials. Um, and then, in some cases, uh, making making sure to show that you're invested either through like if you have if you already have a policy or plan um, in some cases uh, providing uh, a local match um, and that's especially true for wealthier communities who can afford um, to provide some money um, to show that um, this project is they, they really the community wants this project yeah so um so this is just um, a sample outline of a narrative. Sometimes um, funders will be really specific about what they want you to include. Other times they'll just say something like, tell us about your project um, and maybe give you a word count. So I know sometimes that can be really daunting um, to just see kind of a blank page that you need to fill with, uh, with information about your project. So this is really just a sample outline of a way to sort of incorporate all of the things that we were just talking about into a narrative that will help um, explain and contextualize your, your project. Um, so you might do an intro that has some context and connections. Um, you want to give background where you're talking about 
the work that's been done and that local investment. Um, and then you want to state very explicitly what you're going to do with the money and how much you're asking for. And, um, you know, that might seem it might seem redundant if you've already been talking about it, but it's good just to be able to have that statement there um, that people can see and know, OK, this is exactly what they're asking for. Um, and then a project description. Um, if you're awarded funds, how are you going to bring that project to completion? Who's going to carry out the work? Um, include any relevant timelines that you might have, and then include any um, existing partnerships, supporters, or collaborations like Maggie was saying, and then um, having supportive documents that you're able to attach for that, um, either uh, letters of support or partnership agreements, um, also really helpful. And the most important thing is to be clear and concise. If you need more space than you know one to two paragraphs for something, that's great if, if it's information that they need to have to be able to understand this project. Um, but don't feel like just because they have, you know, oh, you've got 5,000 characters to fill that you need to fill all that space. Um, you know, a lot of times shorter can be better if it means that it's gonna be a clearer application. Um, and then also read the fine print for each question. Like I said, sometimes there's nothing. It just says, you know, tell, it, tell us about your project. Other times each question will have sub questions underneath them and they really want you to, to address each of those questions. So if that happens, be sure that you, you're reading through those questions and then go back through and make sure that you've addressed all of those things in your narrative and sometimes explicitly. Um, sometimes what I like to do is actually like start a paragraph or a sentence with a restatement of the question that they've asked uh, just so that they know that this is where I'm addressing this concern even if the answer is no or I don't have anything to say just so that they don't think that that question has been skipped. Um, because a lot of times, you know, things that seem maybe implicit to you, you just want to make sure that it's explicit for the person reading it because when they give you those questions, you know that those are things that they're looking for and maybe things that they're scoring on. So you want to be sure that you're addressing all of those concerns for them. Um, and then uh, just addressing some common common issues here. Um, make sure that your application is complete. So before you before you hit submit on that, just go back through one more time. Make sure that every um, you know every section has been filled out. That all of the attachments that they've asked for are there. Um, sometimes I think that most applications are online at this point. Um, but you know, there's occasionally if, if it needs to be mailed in, maybe they want it in triplicate. Um, you know, just kind of go back through and make sure that you've you've hit all the buttons and checked the marks. You've gone through all of the trouble of putting the application together. Um, you don't want to be disqualified for something like an incomplete application because a lot of times foundations or funders will um, will not accept or consider an application if it isn't complete. Um, and then also, this is just kind of going back. Um, um, if it's uh, sometimes they'll have a prerequisite for um, for applying for funding. Um, just be sure that you're making it explicit that you do meet those requirements. Um, so um, or or where your um, project is in a phase. So um, make sure that you you just state in your application um, sort of where your project is and what has been completed or not so that they um, just sort of know where that fits and that you're you're meeting the requirements that they have. All right, and then this is our last bit of advice for you before we turn it over to Ann and Rachel. So um, just thinking about when you're putting your an application together, just making sure you're reaching out um, to people. Um, don't be afraid to. So um, in, you might have a planning liaison if you have a council of mayors or a council of government. Um, they handle a lot of grant applications, so they might be someone to reach out to. Maybe they, they would be willing to review your application um, for tips. Um, you can sometimes go on a grant website and look at who won the previous year or the in the past and um, you could maybe look at what their project was or even reach out to them um, to get their thoughts or advice. Um, talking to the staff who are actually um, running the grant program, um, not necessarily getting them to read your application, that, that, that probably wouldn't be allowed, um, but you could um, build a relationship with them, get to know them, um, and make sure they're familiar with what, you know, who you are, what your your goals are, and um, and maybe if you do have questions about the application, um, they can they can help guide you. 
Uh, and then in some cases, we do know there, are, there have been cases where engineering firms will um, help a community actually write the grant um, for free, sometimes, not always, but, um, and in that case, then they also would be written into the grant. So if the grant, if your community won the grant, then they would be involved. Um, so that's what's in it for, the, for them. But sometimes it's worth reaching out to different engineering firms to see if they offer a service like that. And then lastly, um, you know, as Julie was saying, proofreading is important and, you know, find, find an editor, find, find a friend, a family member who can read through your grant, um, application to make sure it just eliminate typos, make sure it makes sense to someone else who's maybe not as intimate with the project and, um, yeah, just to jump in, I, I think that's always a great a great last step or, or maybe a second to last step. Um, you've got the application together and as Maggie said, making sure that someone who, who has not seen this project before um, or maybe isn't isn't as um, familiar with the details can read through that and understand what um, what you're trying to do and um, everything flows well is a really great way to make sure that you've, you've kind of hit all those buttons and that it's going to be easy for um, easy for someone else to go through as well. All right. So that is it from Julie and I. Um, now we're going to, we'd like to hear from Rachel and Anne. Um, so we just have to get them unmuted. Um, so Rachel and Anne, um, let's see. I think Anne's gonna go first. Anne, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Great, yes, we can hear both of you. All right, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, Maggie and all the participants today. My name is Ann Nagel. Um, my kids are alumni of the Avoca School District 37. And Rachel and I are both physicians and we have a keen interest in walking and bicycling as a means to one's best health. Particularly for our kids, we can reward them with increased physical activity, improved academic performance, social engagement, and an overall sense of well-being that walk these active transportation provides. So I just want to give you a little snapshot of our district. Um, as it says here on the slide, it serves students from four municipalities, Wilmette, Glenview, Northfield, and Winnetka. We have 740 students in our district, and we have two schools. Avoca West Elementary School is located in Northeast Glenview, and Marie Murphy Middle School is located in Northwest Wilmette. Our district is divided um, in its east and west sides by the Edens Expressway. So kids have to cross the Eden, over the bridge on the Edens if they wanna walk or bike. And currently there is an unprotected sidewalk that measures less than five feet, um, just adjacent to traffic. And our north and south sides of the district are divided by Lake Avenue, which sees more than 33,000 vehicles traveled per day um, at the intersection of Lake and Laramie, which is just a couple hundred yards west of the um, entrance to the southbound Edens. Um, there are no sidewalks in the neighborhood adjacent to Avoca West Elementary School and two blocks west of Marie Murphy School. Uh, last year when we applied for the Safe Routes to School grant, there were really three factors that inspired us to do so. Um, in 2018, we had gone uh, before the village of Wilmette to request a crossing guard at Lake and Laramie. Again, 33,000 cars travel per day on Lake. Speeds have been recorded as high as 50 miles per hour. There have been 65 crashes at that intersection over the last five years. And on a daily basis, twice a day, 120 students cross that intersection. Loyola Academy is located just northeast of that corner. Kids going to the New Trier um, Northfield Freshman Campus travel on this in, across this intersection. And there is a great group of kids, fourth and fifth graders, who ride their bikes from Northfield to Avoca West. Um, but we were told at that time that the intersection was too dangerous for a crossing guard. And because we did not have safe routes to school mapping, so this was not on a safe routes to school grant, we were not eligible for a crossing guard um, according to policy. Um, during, um, Rachel, I forgot to introduce you. I apologize. Um, you can do so in a couple of minutes, I guess. Rachel runs our um, bike training program and she'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, but during one of our bike rodeos, Pete Brennan, who's our esteemed Avoca gym teacher, he's an avid bicycler and he's on our Safe Routes to School team, pulled us aside and said he was totally in favor of our advocacy and this training 
but felt the neighborhood adjacent to Avoca Elementary without sidewalks, crosswalks, or a crossing guard was not really safe for young kids. And also with these other uh, roadways that I've talked about. And then finally, last summer, um, Sherwood Avenue, which is directly adjacent and the only way to get into Avoca West School was reconstructed. The village of Glenview has a sidewalk policy that requires two thirds of the neighbors on a block where a sidewalk would be constructed must be in favor of it. 13 neighbors were polled and the, the um, ballot failed by one. Eight were in favor and five were not in favor. So no sidewalks were reconstructed. So those were our inspirations and I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel to introduce herself and tell you a little bit about some of the specifics of our grant. Hi, I'm Rachel Goodman and I have a son at Marie Murphy. So this has taken us a little while. My son's an eighth grader, almost ready to go to, into high school. And we've talked about how some of these things can take a long time to get going. Um, as Ann um, alluded to, I, for the last, uh, this will be my fifth year this year, I've run the bike and walk to school days. And then we've since added in the last couple of years, the um, bike safety day. So neither of us had written any grants before, and this was very new to us, but somebody in our little community of advocates um, had found the grant and said we should apply for it. So between Anne, myself, and a few other local advocates, we put this together. And just so you understand the whole purpose, you know, we, the whole purpose of our grant was to get Safe Routes to School mapping and then an action plan to help us later. But nobody, you know, we couldn't get any infrastructure grants. We couldn't get any crossing guards because in our district, we did not have any safe routes to school mapping. So we decided to go for an infrastructure grant just to get um, safe routes to school mapping in order to hopefully help with future grant applications and to get infrastructure improvements. But this was a non-infrastructure grant. And uh, because of our challenges with, with having four different villages coming together and everybody was willing to help, but only up to their borders, um, we knew we were gonna need a consultant to help. So some of the specifics of the grant, which is great because you guys have already alluded to this. So the first thing is when we look at the grant and we read through, we're like, what is the GATA por portal? And this grant is something that you have to do on the GATA portal. I still don't completely understand it, but I have to give a good big shout out to our, um, to our school district and the head of business operations there, Beth Deaver, and she helped us navigate that and filled out all the information about budget and things like that for the school district. Um, we also worked, We and, and speaking of time and doing this early, we had to collect Safe Routes to School surveys of parents and tallies from the teachers to get our application together and that took a while. So you have to start early for that. Um, included in the grant, you have to mention things about diversity and stress, low income and free lunches and things like that if, if it's safe, safe Routes to School grant. So basically kind of know your audience. Um, so we, got, we did get a lot of help from ATA. Heather was very, very helpful with us. She wound up, another thing on the application was, are you located in an MPO? And we had no idea what an MPO was. So she introduced us to CMAP um, and John O'Neill actually wrote a letter of support. And then CMAP wound up introducing us to the Northwest Metropolitan, uh, Northwest Municipal Conference who also wrote a letter of support. So we wound up then g gathering the community to come together. We got letters of support from the village of Win um, Wilmette engineer and public works director. We got um, a village of Wilmette trustee we got the superintendent of our school district. We got our board of education to write a letter. We got the village president, Joan Frazier, who may be on this call to write a letter for us. And that was a big, that was very big for us. And so it was really bringing the community together. So the letters of support were really helpful for us. Um, we also included, when we were talking about attachment, we also included pictures, which I think were really, really helpful for us. I don't know if, um, at, um, Maggie, if you have some of the pictures that, yeah, there we go. Yeah. So, so they showed some of our challenges and some of the, the accomplishments that we had done. Uh, we also included maps of our district. And then, um, so, so um, anyway, 
we we were very excited to be awarded this grant and afterwards we wound up putting out so what we had, we had to put out um, bids and, oh actually one more thing I was going to say something you had mentioned so we did discuss you said discuss what's already being done that Wilmette was working on an active transportation plan and that the Skokie Valley Trail is being developed and how that connected with it and I think that was helpful too so we put bids out into the community and um, and we selected um, Epstein and Tim Gustafson is our is our consultant and his assistant Robert who's been working with us and we selected them because they had a lot a lot of knowledge of the area working on projects and including the Skokie Valley Trail and Anne is going to conclude with what basically you know because of this grant now we had a seat at the table when nobody wanted to talk to us um, you, how we were able to, to what we've already accomplished so far and we're not even done with our grant yeah so that's pretty much it but it was really exciting when we um, went to the village in, in Glenview for next the sidewalk petition next to the elementary school you know, we, we sent letters to the village and we were told pretty much that we could come and talk for three minutes at the end of a board meeting. But thanks to this grant and these consultants, we, we're having a great dialogue now. So I think it really opened doors and we've spoken with the same within Wilmette and Northfield and we I feel like we're just coming together and we, we're we going to make some steps and moves. The same thing. Um, we wanted to do a walkabout at this intersection of Lake and Laramie. And we did get a representative from Cook County Department of Transportation, Loyola, Avoca, Nutrier, Wilmette's engineers came, and the police from Wilmette. So really the conversation moved thanks to this grant, and hopefully there'll be great things down the pike. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right, well, thank you both. Um, I love hearing your story. It's really inspiring, and um, and you know it's and you persevered. Like it's it's a long journey, um, but this is like a really this is a very important step to um, making even more changes in the future. And it was um, appreciate you two sharing sharing your story. And we do want to um, open open up. Uh, the webinar to anyone who has any questions for Ann and Rachel or for Julie and I mm -hmm. about anything um, related to um, finding funding and getting involved in grant writing. Um, so you can either you can type um, if you're on your computer, add something to the comment box. Um, you can unmute yourself, unmute yourself, star six. Um, so yeah, feel free to ask away. We're we're here to <laughs> share what we know. I see a couple people typing some things, so we'll, we're, we're, we're eagerly awaiting um, questions. So here we have a question from Pearl. Before applying to the grant, did you have support from your village city hall prior? So for Ann and Rachel. All right. I Well, sort of, we may have left out a little bit of step. When we learned about the Safe Routes to School, our, I, the Safe Routes to School grants, our big ideas were um, coming up with some big infrastructure stuff, like doing a flyover over the Edens Expressway. And then, so we actually did wind up sitting down with, um, with Wilmette's village, uh, uh, the engineer and public works director, and sat at the table hoping to get some amazing grant, you know, support from them for the grant and only to sort of find out that because we don't have safe routes to school mapping, you know, that that we were two steps away from that. And do you have anything else to add? Sorry, I was muted. No, that was perfect. Thank you. Uh, and another question from Jeff. So it says, both Wilmette and Glenview have virtually identical anti-sidewalk policies requiring signatures from two-thirds of residents who live on a proposed route, presumably to prevent spending on sidewalk construction. Wondering what we can do to pressure these villages to make more systematic, systemic sidewalk improvements feasible. Uh, this is the end. I think that hopefully 
without um, the action plan that comes along with our mapping, that policy changes will be recommended. Um, we can look to our neighbors in Winnetka who have a more robust um, sidewalk policy that we, sh we might be able to consider. So I hope that will be part of this process. Yeah, I th and I think like you guys saying you through this grant application, you you're now at the table. You're having conversations with a lot of the decision makers um, in those communities, and that's a step forward to making some changes to that sidewalk policy. And I know that policy can be really frustrating. And there's a few other communities I know of mm -hmm. that have um, a similar policy. And um, yeah, we're there yeah what we're we're also we would love to see um uh some changes to those policies and figuring out how to do that um is still tbd um but i think what you two are doing um is a good potential way to make some changes there and and Anne can speak to this more but before before we got this grant when we were trying to speak at a glenview um a Glenview um, meeting, um, they said, well, you can wait for the whole meeting and th get three minutes at the end. But with this grant, um, and Anne was actually there with our consultant, they actually sat down at the table with, with Glenview planners and for an hour. Anne, do you want to talk about that a little more? Yeah, so this brought us to the table. And also, Maggie, just in terms of the sidewalk policy, as more and more communities adopt a complete streets policy, I think that there is an opportunity there to look at a sidewalk policy and say, how do, they, how do we meld these? They, they have to align. And I don't think they do currently if you, if you want to look at what a complete streets policy would suggest. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, complete streets policies could be if, could be a way to help um, reevaluate perhaps these outdated um, sidewalk policies um, so that there there is more alignment and overall village or city policy. I I just wanted to speak up. My name is Meredith Strasser. I live in Elmhurst. Um, and so we have the same sidewalk policy here. And um, we have safe route to school mapping, but uh, we still have the same block by block policy. And I think like one or two blocks have actually been successful in getting sidewalks. So it's really challenging. Um, so our thinking was that if we could get grant funding, that that would eliminate one of the hurdles in people's opposition to accepting the block by block proposal. Um, so I think where we are right now is trying to, and, and Pearl, who commented earlier, I think that's why she was asking, our issue is, is that we don't know if we can apply for grants without the city's um, coordination in it. Like, you know what I mean? Like without their having planned out essentially how much it's going to cost, et cetera, how are we able and able to to apply for grants just ourselves? Yeah, like in, I don't know if anyone. Has I, in many cases, a grant like there's different different eligibility requirements for a grant. In many cases, your local government does need to be the the primary, the lead um, applicant. Um, okay. But so yeah, so like really developing um, relationships with your and finding some champions within your local government is mm -hmm. often uh, necessary. Um, but I, there are some of the smaller grants that um, maybe for an event or um, just building more community awareness um, that you could kind of go for. Um, but I think um, coordinating with your village or town um, is is a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, that, and Rachel, I don't know if you have anything to add. 
I did also, um, you know, it is so piecemeal, and so it's very, very frustrating. I know when we were talking with Heather Shady earlier on, she had taken a look at Sherwood, and some some towns have, if you're going to reconstruct your house, so you're going to tear down the house and rebuild a new one on that plot, that, it's, you know, like new developments all have to have sidewalks. But how do you retrofit them? And there could be policy to put a sidewalk in front of your house if you rebuild it. I mean, then suddenly it has to, you really need to keep connecting and keep growing. Um, I think so much is at a policy level that mm -hmm. we need to try to get that to move. Right. Yeah, there's yeah. some zoning code adjustments, updates that can be made to, yeah, require these treatments. So, okay. So I suppose, I mean, I think. It, what we're looking at right now is that really we have to have city council agree that there needs to be a policy change before we can have any real change. Mm -hmm. And we do have, um, like, both of the aldermen or alder people who are, who are for our ward that doesn't have sidewalks are both in support of this, so that's positive. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a big hurdle because it's a big city and relatively speaking and to get the rest of the city to want to pay for us to have sidewalks is obviously a challenge right and I don't know how the rest of the city council would vote on it so I don't know we're, we're, yeah we're not sure where it's gonna go um, in Wilmette we also had a walkabout at the school where we inv invited all of the council, this village council, we did get one trustee to come. And we also had uh, representatives from the school, the police, the Glenview police, and did a walkabout there just to see at dismissal, what does it look like? And what are these kids' challenges? Ah. And Okay, can you explain more about that, that walkabout to school? How did you organize that and what did that entail? Um, it's pretty easy, and I'd be happy to talk with you off offline, too, or, you know, sure. share and stuff. But, you know, you invite all the, the key stakeholders and say, we'd like you to come and meet us at the school at dismissal. And we're going to go to a corner where we're going to watch kids walk in the street with the 1,900 cars that are passing by, you know, at dismissal or whatever it is. And they really it really gets a sense, and it starts the conversations. Uh, you know, a big conversation I remember from that walkabout was the police, and one of the policemen comes to our bike rodeo, and we all talked about what it was like as a kid to walk to school with your friends. And right. you don't see that you, because the kids, you know, their parents pick them up be, or they get, they actually get picked right. up from when they live a block away. And right. um, I, it was very, I think it was very impactful. Um, so, okay. walk about, you know, walk audits, walkabouts are, it just brings everybody together and you have those conversations. And probably in That's retrospect, true. I would even video it because then you could take it back to the council yeah. for people that didn't come. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, because so much of it is like just those of us, you know, moms and kids, when we're walking, we're the ones experiencing these cars going 40, like, you know, mm -hmm. 30 feet away from us. Yeah. But you can't, you can't really express that in a city council meeting, you know. Mm -hmm. They don't, you can't really understand that, so. And the, the hugest champion are the kids. We had kids on this walkabout who told the trustee what it was like to walk. Wow. Yeah, oh, that's great. You know, and the fact that they had to walk in the snow because they couldn't walk in the street or they didn't want to walk in the grass because their shoes got wet and then they didn't have wet shoes at school all day. So it was those really personal things that um, okay. really made their mark. And the other that's thing awesome. about that walkabout, uh, we had already through the, you know, the bike and walk to school day, we had made relationships with the police. So the, the police person who does the schools he came and he brought his police chief with him yet yeah. with all the invitations that went out only one trustee came to this walkabout it was very interesting mm. okay yeah yeah i mean there's some, like our mayor is it's tough it's we're kind of like the neglected part of elmhurst it's not as high income <laughs> in the north side and that you know the, the there's not as many businesses, and it's just to get any attention up here is difficult, let alone, like, a huge project like that to get sidewalks throughout the ward. 
so it's like an uphill battle, but I, it's, it's hopeful to hear these stories, so thank you. Yeah, um, Rachel and Ann are great resources, and I, I love the walkabout idea. It's like just building relationships um, with decision makers, elected officials, and having them see it rather than just telling them. Um, okay. And building, continue, and you, in Elmhurst, you guys are, you guys have a good um, group of parents um, who are already, you know, are all on board about the need for more sidewalks. And I think that um, keep, keep building that group um, and that can help continue put more, to put more pressure on um, elected officials. Yeah, and one thing we haven't done is gone to the school board yet, so that's another right. step. Yeah, to try to get them. Yeah. And then Ann and I were actually talking about this before, but there's um, this walking college. It's the America Walks Walking College, which Ann was. Uh, you were a part of that co that college a couple of years ago. Um, Ann, yeah. do you want to speak more about that? Because that can be also a good resource to organize yourself and. Right. So America Walks offers every year um, an opportunity to be part of their walking college. And I'm going to forget, it's about a 12-week program where every week you're just introduced to resources to promote walking and biking in your community, as well as you have uh, mentors, uh, nationally recognized mentors, who you meet with on, a, I think, every other week basis to talk about um, uh, you have to work on a walking action plan. So you have to come up with how could I enhance something in my community? Um, and so you work with these mentors to help you develop that plan, which you then present at the end of the training and you are invited to their walk, the America Walks Walking Summit and they pay for it. Um, it the, Abby Beck might be on the call too. She's um, an alderman from Batavia and she also, and it just really helps you get the tools to learn who you should talk to, how to do it. And the application is just opened. If anybody wants to talk to me about it, it was a wonderful experience. I actually, the group that we, we were the suburban group, there's four of us. We still meet on a call about every other month, even though we graduated two years ago, just to hear what advocacy work we're doing and to, and it's pretty amazing what the, our little group's doing. So um, I made huge friendships from it and, and learned so much. So. Um, the application's just opened. Okay, thank you. Maggie, is there any way that you could send me that information or I can have that? Yes, I will. Yeah, because the application okay. just opened and I just saw an email about it, so I will make sure to share with you. I'll share with everyone um, because it's a really great program. We've, uh, we've known a number of advocates who have done it and gotten a lot out of it. Um, thank you. So we're kind of, nearing one o'clock and I know there were a few more questions and maybe I can email with you um, to address um, some of the remaining questions. Um, I know there is one question about bike um, using funding um, for bike events um, and there are some of those private grants that I mentioned uh, might be applicable to bike to bike to some bike events. Um, often those um, require more volunteer hours. It's actually um, very cheap to host a bike event um, and you can get donations often um, for those types of things and I can email you more ideas. Um, Michael, who asked that question? Um, but otherwise we'll wrap this up. Anne and Rachel, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I'm good. Thank you so very much. No, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you too. It's um, really appreciated hearing your story. So, um, and thanks everyone for joining the call today. Um, we'll get this up on YouTube soon. Um, and feel free to um, email me if you have any other questions. Um, again, we have these Google groups. Um, a lot of you are already on the Google group for different suburban areas um, where I share a lot of different information, but when I learn about grant opportunities, I try to make sure to alert the Google groups. So you can email me, maggie at activetrans.org, if you'd like to be added to one of the groups. And then again, we have a list of different funding opportunities, so you can dig into those a little more um, at activetrans.org slash complete streets coalition. So 
Um, hey, Maggie, this is Chris. I'm sorry. Can you tell me, are, are you going to be able to email the slides out to the group? By chance? Oh, sure. Yeah, happy to do that, too. Great. Thank you. Yes. Let's share it. Sounds good. All right. Well, thanks all, um, and we'll see you next time.